I do not have enough words in the English dictionary properly express what the hell we watched on Monday Night Raw last night. I am so amped. Banger. In the words of Sheamus, it was definitely a banger. But hi, all you BC WrestlePod nerds out there, and welcome to another rendition of the Raw Squad Review, your weekly WWE Monday Night Raw Review team. I am one of your hosts, Mikey, also known as El Jefe around the BC WrestlePod part. I am the man with half the plan and the face that kind of runs the place. And joining me this week, we have, still out of the basement, we have Mini, which is important to have because... There was way too much goodness that happened on Raw that, you know, I needed him here for this one because it's... Luchadon is still in Mexico trying to figure out the AAA stuff, but, like, holy schmoly, that episode like, of Raw was fire. Like, yeah. this might be, like, like I'm going to spoil it. This might be a 10 episode. Honestly, I'm probably going to give it a 10 as well, but we got to, like always, we got to break through this, so let's not waste any more time. If you have been following us at this point, y'all can follow the socials and the YouTubes and the Twitch and everything, but I really want to get into this episode of Raw because not on my bingo card, we open up with the return of Seth freaking Rollins. I was like, how is he this man back cleared? early as fuck? Like, he left after Mania, which is at the beginning, which was the beginning of April, and we're in the middle of June. There's not even, like, a whole two months. But Seth came back, I was like, I want to. I want whatever this man is on. I want to know what fountain of youth he is using, because that is a quick turnaround time. Yeah, we were. I wasn't expecting him till after SummerSlam. Yeah, I wasn't expecting him to return until like the Road to Survivor Series. But no, he comes back. He cuts a promo, and he gets interrupted by El Campeón, Damian Priest. And again, Damien's just out here and we start off with the strong because, you know, Seth is making a case to be involved in the Money in the Bank ladder match. But Damien's like, nah, bro, you ain't about to do this. I know I can beat you. So how about at Money in the Bank, you versus me, Seth accepts. And like within the span of like five minutes, we get our first match for Money in the Bank. Damien's defending his title against Seth freaking Rollins. I was like, oh my God, it's going to be that kind of night for Raw. Ooh, it's about to get on and pop. It was good though, because thank God, because we know that Damien Priest isn't like relinquishing the title due to his leg, due to that scary spot at that Clash. Clash. That's, yeah, that's the important so he's bit good. too. So Seth is good. Damien's good. We're about to have this match at Money in the Bank. I am excited. This was a very strong way to start out Monday Night Raw because the surprises kept coming and I was, it, oof, we will get into everything. So we get Damien versus Seth at Money in the Bank. We cut backstage where Chad Gable wants another rematch with Sammy. Scrap Daddy Adam Pierce says, no, you don't get to. You got to get to the back of the line. Chad Gable says, I don't get back to the back of the line, but I want to fight somebody now. So <laughs> Adam Pierce says, all right, you're going to get a match. Then we cut to the match, which was next. Chad Gable is about to get destroyed because who's his opponent but the giant himself, Braun Strowman. And just watching Chad Gable's eyes as Braun <laughs> made his entrance is like, I just hear I just hear the meme, and it was in this moment. He knew. He He's effed up. up. I, I mean, this was a typical match that I was expecting. Chad tried to do his best, but Braun Strowman is a whole entire tree of a human being. And so he kind of just slapped Chad around. Just Braun being Braun. Big dude doing big dude things. You know, Chad wanted Alpha Academy to get involved. They did not really, which then caused Braun, which caused Chad the match. Braun Strowman picked up the victory here. Essentially, this was a comedic squash match. And so what happened afterwards, though, is the important bit because Chad is berating Akira Tozawa. This man grabs and twists his ear like he's in like kindergarten. Like he's once a child, again. and he bitch slapped the fuck out of him. Oh my gosh, that man! Like okay, got this is after feet. he took. This is after he took Maxine's, Maxine's crutch. crutch. Like he's a school bully. Like oh, you can't have it. Throws it over the ropes and then slaps the fuck out of Tozawa. Like it was so loud, Otis heard it over the crowd. Oh no, I muted myself. I got all excited. <gasps> When I tell you I agree with you, I was just like, exactly, because Ch Chad was getting in Otis's face. Otis did the thing. He stood up for himself, and he 
man, that was the best thing that happened. I was like, my boy Otis did it. Otis is growing up to become a, he's no longer being a caterpillar. He's being a full-blown butterfly. The most exciting thing for me is, do you know how much the crowd is going to be behind with not only Otis, but the rest of Alpha Academy? They're about to be probably the biggest baby faces other than Sami Zayn on Monday Night Raw right now. Now, there's one other baby face I feel like is bigger, and that's, named, that's Jay Uso, but... I mean, that's very true, but Otis is, like, our lovable bowling ball, and the WWE Universe loves him so much. I love this. I was hoping that this would happen at Clash at the Castle, but I'm glad we got this on Monday Night Raw, and it seems that Chad Gable might be having to deal with some other stuff for a little bit, which we'll talk about so when we get to the end. What what I was... You know, as much I kind of did for a little bit, want to see heel Otis actually helping Chad Gable because I thought it would have been something interesting. But I'm still completely okay with this. I am too. I like this. And you know, we could talk about what happened later in the show because Otis, Maxine, and Kira Tozawa, Otis is helping everyone pack their stuff. Chad Gable comes backstage. He tries to berate Alpha Academy for not helping him. Chad asks where they're going. Otis zips up the bag. He's like, we're done and we're leaving. And they proceed to leave. And he tried hitting them with the family doesn't leave each other. And I Otis mean, is like, we're, we're done. Bye. I was like, yeah, Otis and the rest of Alpha Academy are stood up to Chad Gable. And Otis was able to get Maxine and Akira Dezawa out. So I am, you know, if the Creeds end up going with Chad, I hope that Ivy Nile ends up going with Otis and the rest of Alpha Academy because Ivy, in what we've seen on television, her character is friends with Maxine and they uh, team well, they, a lot together. Yeah, that's like a woman's tag team is Maxine Dupree and Ivy Nile. So we I might get love- those. We might get them splitting up and we'll get Alpha Alpha Academy and Otis's I- Funhouse. Yeah. I'm not sure what to call Otis's group. I'm hoping we get a little bit more from Tozawa because I actually really like watching him wrestle because he's athletic as fuck. I do too. I, you know, and this is just a personal thing. I love his scent, but I just, I don't want that to be his finisher all the time. But yeah, I want to see more Tozawa on my television screen. But that, that was, <laughs> keep in mind, we're not even to the other good shit yet. This is just like, this is like the first like hour of Raw. That consistent storytelling because then. Mm-hmm. We continue to plant the seeds of dissent in the Judgment Day because we cut backstage to the clubhouse where a couple of things go down. Number one, Finn Balor teases that when he wins Money in the Bank, he's going to cash in on Cody Rhodes. And I'm just like, mm, we know where this is going. Damien's like, and then the other thing is that Carlito has a match also, but Dom cannot find his vest, his cow printed vest. We're going red. Damien asked Finn, yo. Why'd you take that card last week? Super sus, dude. Mm-hmm. I was, I was like, like, he called out. I threw like, it away, dog. I didn't do anything weird. I totally didn't go have fun with Mommy Liv Morgan because that's totally what I would have done. No, and then Carlito also started to give dumb shit. Oh, you left it in Liv's uh, little hotel room, did you? And David Priest was like, nah, dog. Don't you got a match to prepare for? I know. I was just like, dang, Carlito is still getting bullied by Judgment Day out here. I don't even know if he's a part of Judgment Day or not. I don't even know anymore. They just keep him around. I'm just like, but Carlito is continuing to feud with the LWO for some reason. But, you know, it's WWE Mexican on Mexican warfare. That's also very, very fair, which is unfortunate. But Carlito leaves to get ready for his match. And we then cut to our second match of the evening. This is for the women's money in the bank qualifier. And it was announced earlier in the week that all the Money in the Bank qualifiers would be triple threats, which I love because that gives more people screen time instead of just having a singles one-on-one match. So it's a triple threat. But this women's qualifier had Io Sky, Kiana James, and Zelina Vega. I got to say, Zelina looked amazing in this match. She looked, people forget how good of an in-ring performer she is. Bro, I was just like... We got to do more with Zelina and not just throw her on the international pay-per-views. That 619 to cut EO off of the top rope. She did the 619 through the top rope. I was like, yes, it was so clean. Her code red was really clean. The code red is one of my favorite finishers from her. It was awesome. 
and all three women did an awesome job. We know EO can do all the crazy things. Zelina is your quick mover. Kiana has a bit, has a really good power base when it comes to her wrestling, being the powerhouse, like holding girls and throwing them. I'm like, Kiana's kind of strong despite her physical appearance. But Liv makes her way out, which causes a distraction to Zelina, which allows EO to pin Kiana for the win. It seems, though, that we might be getting Liv versus Zelina at Money in the Bank, and I'm not upset about it. <laughs> was this match the one where, like, Judgment Day started fighting on the out? No, they weren't even out there for this one. No, that would be later. Because there was a bit, I was watching it, and, like, the whole thing happening, and Dom was running around and just, like, pimp, he just, like, drive by punches his dad, and then keeps going. That happens later. That was, later that was the Finn Balor match. Okay, yeah. I that remember happens now. later. No, I think that happens during the Dragon League Carlito match. No, that does happen during the Ravens there. Dom was all over the place this episode. Dom just like, like drive by punches his dad and throws him <laughs> to the barricade and just keeps going. That was funny, but EO for the second year in the row is making her way to Money in the Bank, and we learned that for each ladder match, there's going to be six women and six men. So EO has earned her spot. Will EO do the impossible and win consecutive back to back Money in the Banks? I don't know. I have to see what the rest of the field does, but her shots of doing so might, you know, are at the top of my list. Zelina's not done, though, because she is upset that Liv cost her the opportunity. And uh, yeah, we'll just say this now. Later in the evening, during the Dragon League Carlito match, Zelina comes out and attacks Liv. I think, like I said, I think we're getting Zelina versus Liv at Money in the Bank, which I would not be upset about. And what I'm noticing a pattern here is that Triple H is alternating the main men's and mains like the main women's titles which one gets to be on the pay-per-view because we had live defend live and becky at king and queen of the ring bailey defended at clash and so i think money in the bank unless both women's championships are on the line i think live is doing money in the bank <laughs> yeah then lash of berlin will be bailey again and then well, Bailey definitely is going to have to go back to back because she's facing Nia at SummerSlam because Nia I think, won Queen. Well, SummerSlam is the big one, so I think all the belts are going up. They have to, I, but I'm happy for EO. And, you know, what's something that also made me super happy? Sami Zayn comes down to the ring to cut this promo. He verbally lets us know that he is done with Chad Gable and Alpha Academy. I'm like, okay, we're moving on. But he wants, he is here to address what's next. Before he could say anything else, Braun Breaker makes his way down. It took me a while. I'm kind of growing with his new theme song. I have missed the old one <laughs> that he had in NXT, but you know, it is what it is. But let me tell you, Braun's Breaker out here. This was a funny juxtaposition, and someone on the internet pointed this out, and I loved it. This juxtaposition between the darkest person and the whitest person cutting a promo in the same ring against each other. Braun's got an aura, dude. Oof. But before we get to this other person that came out, Braun literally just made it crystal clear. He know he tells Sammy, Sammy knows why Braun's out here and that if he doesn't give him what he wants, he's going to break him in half like a folding chair. And Sammy says, all right, you want a chance at this? And before Sammy could say anything, Bella interrupts. Sheamus comes on out and also lays stake to the Intercontinental Championship. Braun and Sheamus go back and forth exchanging some words, and Sammy does the smartest thing I have seen a babyface ever do. He realizes that these two are going to kill each other, so why not have a number one contenders match later in the evening, but he going to dip so he doesn't get caught in the crossfire. Spoiler alert, he still got caught in the crossfire later. But Sheamus versus Braun Breaker was not on my bingo card this episode, and as no, soon as I knew that's what we were getting... Too. yeah. As soon as I knew we were going to get this later in the evening, I was like, you know, I'm I think Raw, it. if it consistently does this every week, I might give the, this my highest rating every single week. What a way to start out the week in wrestling, too. So we get a recap video of Isla Dawn and Alba Fire's win. The Hex Girls, as I called them on our Clash at the Castle review. The most unexpected victory ever. Ever in front of their home crowd. So they are being interviewed backstage and they get yeah, interviewed. There were the Scottish girls that won. Yeah, they were the Scottish girls that won. So they get interrupted by Zoe Stark and Shayna Baszler. Shayna pointing out what the rest of the internet did that, you know, she technically tapped Bianca out, and I mean Jade out. So regardless, it seems that Zoe and Shayna are on the collision path to be number one contenders yet again for these tag titles. 
I'm excited. I think this is going to be interesting program, but like I'm tired of Shayna and Zoe always being put in number one contenders and then they never win. Well, I think they're going to, I think Abba Fire and I think ha the Hacks girls are going to be transitional champs. Yeah, and it makes me very sad because I like them. I'm not mad that they won at Clash at the Castle. It's just I'm mad that they're not utilized more because they are both t awesome talents and they barely had any TV time. So hopefully this will change things. So then we get into the aforementioned Dragon Lee versus Carlito match. Dragon Lee wants revenge on Carlito. I'm like, sir, that was all the way back in April. And now we're getting to this in the middle of June. What happened? Like, why are we having this match like two months late? I don't know anymore. Oh, this is no. crazy. This was ended up being a quick match. Dragon Lee and Carlito go back and forth. Shenanigans happen because we get Liv coming hey, out. That car that okay. There was a point. There was two points I want to talk about this match. One, oh, for Carlito's him. selling that Hurricane Rana from the outside of the ring. I thought that was funny. And two, when there was distraction on the outside, like I brought it up earlier, Dominic just drive by just like drive by throwing his dad into the barricade and just get then stop and then doesn't touch anybody else after that he's just like fuck you dad which was kind of nuts and then on top of that you had Liv morgan come out to try to be a distraction and Zelina vegas like oh hell no and starts beating her up because she's still mad at what happened earlier in the evening which was enough for carlito to get the win here i'm just like this was a lot <laughs> Liv morgan came out with the vest on yes and so dom, now was, dom was like Give me back my vest. And she was like, you got to come get it. And then Ooh. Selena Vanny comes out, starts beating her up on top of Dom. And I'm over here going, it should have been me. The, I'm just uh, like, what in the flip? Then, yeah, then that's when everything just broke up all the hell. Then Carlito won. What's the last time we've seen Carlito win a match? Seriously. Carlito. Love it. But, you know. So we leave, so we leave this. We already talked about Otis and Alpha Academy leaving Chad. Next, we get to this also in-ring promo where Drew McIntyre can't even mention CM Punk's name without getting upset and emotional. And literally, this is like dragging on and he's like, oh, I can't do this anymore. Screw this company. I quit and walks out. So I'm like, Drew McIntyre has quit the company. I think that this was a clever way for them to basically have him go off, off for a little bit because his wife just got emergency surgery. Yeah, so... He's going to be focusing his attention on that. You know, all things I like, we wish speedy recovery to Mrs. Drew McIntyre. So we hope that whatever has happened, everything's good. We are with Drew McIntyre as he goes through this. I would not be surprised because people have been saying because they wouldn't be surprised if Drew shows up and beats the tar out of punk at SmackDown on Friday. But, you know, who knows? We shall see what happens. So next, we get a very short tag team match, Damage Control versus Caden Carter and Katana Chance. This really didn't go anywhere because Lyra Valkyria comes out to aid Katana and Caden. Damage Control lose. Yep, that was about the extent of that match. <laughs> this was a two-minute match. This was, I will say, this is probably the weakest part of the evening. I was like, all right, well, it's fine. All right, so after this, we go to backstage promo with Damage Control and... EO is not happy with Dakota and Kyrie and says that things need to change or she will make them change. I'm like, don't make EO mad. She will hurt you. She's a scary. She's the second scariest Japanese girl there. Seriously, it Asuka's is the scariest, but she's not there right now. This is going to. OK, so then we get into the banger match that was Sheamus versus Braun Breaker with number one contendership implications to all of this and this was an awesome match what do you expect from hard-hitting Seamus and the dog got that sure. dog in him exactly as commentary likes to point out to us you know you Braun doesn't get phased because like that failed Frankensteiner botch was I was like, oh, he just knows. He just knows. Sold it. Just kept going. Exactly. He knows. Sold it. It's like, all right, you forgot. I was like, oh yeah, he because he's breaking people in half. Not even like two minutes later. This was a baller match. This was probably my favorite match of the whole entire evening. Braun continues to prove that he's a dominant force. Sheamus is also. This was giving me the Sheamus that debuted those years ago. It's like, yes, be brutal and violent. But this match ends at a DQ, so we don't have a definitive winner because Luke. Ludwig Kaiser comes out and he attacks Seamus 
And so there's no clear cut conclusion. Braun Breaker is breaking people in half. Sheamus and Kaiser are fighting. Sammy gets caught in the crossfire. Could we possibly be seeing a triple threat or a fatal four way for the intercon? No, a triple threat for the Intercontinental Championship at the Money in the Bank. Probably, but that spot where Ludwig was going around and do the dropkick thing he does, and Broad runs around to the other side and spears him, breaks this man in half. Oh my god, that was hilarious! You know, I, I saw those, and people edited and put sonic rings on Ludwig <laughs> after he got speared. I was like, oh, that is fantastic. That was such a good spot. The camera work was incredible on that. Oh, my gosh. I (laughs) that spot was crazy. I am not mad that we could possibly be getting a triple threat for the Intercontinental Championship at Money in the Bank, but it makes me excited. All right, let's get into the steaminess that was this backstage segment next because Dom finally has Liv Morgan. Dom tells her that he wants the cow vest back and Liv says you're gonna have to take it off me if you want it and so in like with even without the telenovela music dom slowly reaches out and, and he's he, slowly he, unzipping he's doing it because he's like awkward he's like i, I don't want to like, do, do, do this my wife is gonna kill me but who get but who catches him and i was just like but damien priest catches him and damien's like dom what are you doing and he's like i want my vest back and so damien turns Liv, give him the vest back no, he tells Dom, get the vest back. And so he quickly undoes it and then takes the vest and leaves. And Damien's like, Liv, you need to leave him alone. He wants nothing to do with you. And then Liv's like, oh, but he wants everything to do with me and proceeds to leave. Should like, have been me. Rhea Ripley, when she comes back, is going to tear Liv in half. And I'm here for this. I cannot wait. This is going to be crazy. So then we get a quick carry and cross of promo where next week he's going to have a match and he doesn't care if he's facing Kofi or Xavier, that whoever it is can answer the call, which then leads into the New Day cutting a promo on carry and cross. So we're getting carry and versus either Xavier or Kofi. Hold up. I just saw some news. What's up? That battle royale for the NXT, the number one contendership. Javon Evans. <laughs> no, no. Do you know who just showed up? Joe Hendry. Yeah. Well... I had heard that some TNA folks would be in this battle royale. So I was like, Joe Hendry. Dude, his pop was huge. Man, I got, I got to, I'm going to be watching that afterwards to figure out because this battle royale determines who Trick is facing at Heat Wave, which is the day after Money in the Bank. That's nuts. All righty. So let's get into our main event, which is a men's qualifying match. We get main event to Jay Uso, who had a really awesome in the backstage in the, the arena with some fans before making his way through the crowd to his entrance, to his theme song, taking on Finn Balor and Rey Mysterio in this men's Money in the Bank qualifier. Honestly, this was a really fun match. This had everything I wanted. Finn doing Finn things. Ray being the luchador he is. Main event, Jay Uso. Ray this- had this moment of this insane offense. He was 50, 49 years old. I know. He's like, almost he just, 50 years old. He, he literally. Like he, everybody's ass. He activated the star for Mario Kart. Like, homeboy was thro- like running house. But at the end of the day, your main event man, Jay Uso, Mr. Yeet. The yeeter of worlds, if you will, ultimately picks up the victory. So he secures the first spot in the men's money in the bank ladder match. All right, let's talk about the reason we are all here. Because as main event, Jay Uso is celebrating in the ring. The lights begin to cut out and shut off. And then the arena in Corpus Christi, Texas goes off. Then we get Bray Wyatt's theme playing. Then we cut to the stage where the door has made an appearance again. The door opens and the first thing that comes on out is this living visage of Sister Abigail, which we know is Nikki Cross behind that thing as she crawls a la grudge style. Her mask was terrifying. Oh my gosh. When, when she came up close to the lantern and it lit up her whole face, I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, what in the mascot horror is this? Dude, it was legitimately like this was a dope. Like I was like hoping, but please don't botch their fucking like debut and hear it. Oh my god, they did not. Okay, let's walk through this because I want to give all the time to this. So, Sister Abigail, she stands up and then she. 
this cameraman better get paid extra because he had to walk through everything that happened. He's like, really? Aw, man. So Sister Abigail points to the back. So the cameraman goes to the backstage and then it suddenly turns into a Universal Studios Halloween horror house. And I'm just like, because first we turn the corner, we see security and some other folks laying on the ground as we have Ramblin' Rabbit with the help hammer standing above some things. And then we get into gorilla position where the lights flicker. We get some exploding fireworks. Like, I think I saw Gunther in the corner laid out on some boxes. <laughs> I think Harry and Cross got like, bl like bludgeoned <laughs> against the wall. And then we see Mercy the Buzzard just sitting crisscross applesauce on some stacks of crates. Then we push into the backstage area further where we see Huskers the pig in the very terrifying mask, might I add. This is some hills have eyes shit. And this isn't crazy. So then the money shot, though, before this, we see Chad Gable got blunted across the head. Yeah, it looks like he got shot. If, you know, people were posting. I was like, like oh, they oh, murdered wicked. Chad Gable. His, his Wikipedia page got changed. He said Chad Gable died because he got shot in the head by the White Six. The other joke says, nah, it wasn't the White Six that killed him. It was Otis before the White Six debuted. And he blamed it on them. There. Do you see the one that looked like Gunther? I want to say, I think the one that was like laying on the crates, like before we got to, into the Husker scene was Gunther just laying on some crates. I think I saw Carrie and Cross where he was in front of like the big old splatter next to Mercy the Buzzard. There's, there's, okay. So I'm seeing things, all the potential slash confirmed people that got attacked by the White Six. It was Carmelo Hayes, Gunther, Dominic Mysterio, Triple H, Chad Gable. For some reason, Cody Rhodes was there, but I don't think Cody Rhodes was there. So I'm not sure how legitimate this is, but. But yeah, Chad Gable was a visual representation. Of, oh, they took him and probably some other people in this roster out. And then the camera pans and we get the silhouette of Uncle Howdy, who then collects the rest of the Wyatt Six. They make their way to the ramp. We to get a massive pop. Oh, my gosh. They're all staring there. The crowd is cheering. They're yelling. You know, Uncle Howdy grabs the lantern, says we're here. We have arrived, blows it out, and that is how Monday Night Raw goes off the air. When I tell you this five minutes was pure cinema to me, this oh, was, was incredible. nuts. It was incredible. Did you, did you see what the uh, the interview they did with Jey Uso after this? He's like, they can have the eater. He goes, nah, I don't want none of this smoke, man. They can have the fireflies back. I don't, I don't want none of that smoke. Which is smart because, you know, I, w I, I was afraid that, you know, the talent that didn't get attacked... They'd be like, no, nah, I'm not scared of that. I was like, don't be stupid. You just witnessed Chad Gable and a couple other folks get murdered, possibly like manslaughtered on our screen. But when I tell you this, like was the icing on the cake for this Monday Night Raw from beginning to end, I enjoyed everything. We progressed storylines. We had great matches. We already know where we're going for some of these for Money in the Bank. Then you get the debut of the Wyatt Six to top it all off. Minnie, this is the first time in this history of BC WrestlePot that we did this. I'm giving this a 10 out of 10 for me. Empanadas. Like, this was a perfect episode. And I'm a little biased because, to some extent, all of us here at BC WrestlePod had some affinity to Bray Wyatt. Whether it was his creative mind, the character he was doing, his in-ring wrestling, whatever it was. But to me... This was an awesome passing of the torch moment of bringing this vision that Bray wanted to do so bad, but because the former management wasn't allowed to do so. And I'm sad that he doesn't get to see this, but man, I'm excited to see what the Wyatt Six under a Paul Levesque Triple H management gets to do. I just need WWE to not screw this one up. And from what we have read in reports, they're not so much going to be leaning towards the supernatural, but more so like the hills have eyes like horror slasher. And I'm kind of here for that if it's more like a slasher type of thing. But Minnie, what did you think of this whole entire last five minutes? And then what do you give this rating for Raw? My co-host is preoccupied. So yeah, this was a 10 out of 10 for me. Minnie also agreed that this was a 10 out of 10 for him. And that is how we are going to end this week's Raw Squad review. This was a really good Raw. I am excited to see what happens. But for myself and Minnie and the rest of the BC WrestlePod boys, remember, take care of yourself, love one another, stay biconic, but more importantly than anything, you always deserve to finish your story. 
We'll catch you later. But until then, adios, sayonara, and tata for now. Thank you so much for tuning in to another Vibe Tribe production. What's going to happen next time? Well, you're going to have to tune in to find out. But until then, remember, take care of yourself, love one another, and as always, make sure that you keep the good times rolling. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you next time.